Hello and welcome to another episode of the Seria Chronicles podcast. I'm Mina Rizuki and as always I will be joined by Nikki Bandini and Patrick Kendrick. But this is going to be a very feisty one guys, but before we get into it, I just want to remind you to subscribe to the Seria Chronicles YouTube channel and watch our clips and shorts and don't forget our special offer with Manscaped. Get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com with the code Seria at the checkout. Hello to Nikki and Patrick. Now I've told you guys before this is going to be a feisty one. I mean, we've already argued off air about what we should talk about and how we should talk to <laughs> this and what it all means, <laughs> okay? So um we're three people who are never shy of uh re- telling people, let's say, what we think. But we're going to start at the top with Juventus because as we all know Allegri has been sacked. There was a dramatic match against Bologna to see who would potentially finish in third place. There's also Atalanta to look at it. It was a, a fascinating game in which Bologna went 3-0 up and then Juventus managed to score three goals in eight minutes. But we haven't come to you with a, really a debate on what happened with Allegri, with the sacking. Um, and uh, let's say we have um, deferring views on on how important this is um, i'll go to you patrick how is everyone actually all good lovely yeah um a little bit calmer than allegri i think at, at this moment in time so patrick said something along the lines of you know he took off his his jacket allegri at the end of the final in the final and i he was just a little bit done with his whole shtick <laughs> um, you know it's it's been an overused type of way of sort of provoking something emotion pride from his players i personally said that i absolutely loved it <laughs> but i'm the resident juventino right i mean i thought when he did that whole strip tease it was just it was like a symphony it was like a oh like you know oh, how wow. can i okay. how can i go and like find this man? i think also like you have to understand if, if from a from a journalistic point of view or if I look at this as a professional, then totally unprofessional. This is not what Juventus stand for. Um, more importantly, this isn't what Allegri used to stand for, right? Allegri, the one thing about him was that he was a breath of fresh air after Antonio Conte in the sense that he wasn't somebody who complained so much about the referees. He was just a company man. He seemed very calm. And Carlos Tevez continued to talk about, at the time, his empathy in the dressing room. And then he slowly gone mad <laughs> and I obviously the job has, has had an effect of it as well but I think as a Juventus fan having watched what Juve have gone through the last two seasons and feeling there hasn't been this strong management there hasn't been a way of protecting this club that the one man who has who has sort of stood as a pillar and represented us if you like the anger of Juventus fans has indeed been Max Allegri so someone who was so deeply hated by a lot of the fans, he ended up being actually quite loved after after all of that, well, after all the antics. There's a lot who've come out to be like, well, thank you. Thank you for defending us. Thank you for screaming, Dove Rocky, <laughs> which, was, uh, which was hilarious. But um, I feel like we might all disagree on this. Um, yes. Um... <laughs> I think we might disagree. Nikki um, just so enjoys the controversy. <laughs> just so here for it. You know? I've got my tea. I need some popcorn. I need some popcorn to get my tea. She's like, fight, fight. Where's the man? I feel like <laughs> I, I feel like I've got I feel like I've got carte blanche here because I'm not sure there was necessarily a question in all that. But um, what I would say is, I felt for Max Allegri. I think it was him laid bare, literally. Um, stripping <laughs> off. I think the only thing missing was the sort of loudspeakers at the Stadio Olimpico playing, you can keep your head on. I think that would have been perfect. But um, I, unfortunately, he's not done it. It's not the first time he's done it. He's he's a repeat offender with this. We've, we've, I, I, I suppose the, the best thing would have been to have actually kept a list down the years. You'd almost need, need the person who works on the archives at Juventus to be able to tell you which matches he has remove various items of clothing but it seems to be various degrees of anger it starts with his jacket and this was the first time I think he'd gone beyond the tie so the the shirt started to come off as well and I feel for him because as you said as you said (laughs) um, I mean first of all he's I think he's well in his 50s isn't he 
he's very lean for his, for his age. I think we should also give him that. Yes, he's a former professional athlete, but I think he, he always looks the part in his suit. Anyway, I don't know Moving if that's on. being lean or whether that's just like anger has eaten him up at this point. <laughs> And then he's an actual professional athlete. But yes, go on. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but I think he hasn't had any protection. He hasn't been given any assurances over his future. He's insinuated throughout the spring that, you know, he'll be getting things off his chest at the end of the season, that the club and he will decide what the best is for the club's future. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and Pioli's done something similar at Milan. It's constantly a case of, I'm not what's important. The club will tell me in due time what the club's plans are which is just basically in in other words him saying I won't be at the club I can't reveal it at this at this stage and so I think it was just vindication for him it's just been he's been constantly undermined by the media the club have never come out and protected him it's not Mm -hmm. been a particularly easy job Mm -hmm. he's made a rod for his own back with the overwhelming success he had in his first spell with five league titles four of those um cup League and Cup doubles, plus two Champions League finals. And Juventus aren't that dominant force anymore. This is always going to be transition. And I actually respect Allegri for having the courage to step back in and going there for a second stint. And I think we've been critical about him here as well. The football has not been champagne football. Then again, when is it with Juventus? That would be my point. Thank you. It's not, not been champagne football. It's Thank been you. rubbish football. I'm sorry. No, for sure. Okay. It's been terrible but ultimately, football. Ultimately, all that matters is. in that club is winning. And by the, mm. by the same token that you can't win the league every single year, and I mm-hmm. think, again, Juventus winning nine in a row skewed people's expectations. Exactly. If you're not going to win the league and you're not playing in Europe, all you can win is the Coppa Italia. And he won the Coppa Italia and he got them into the Champions League. And he would argue that whether you come second, as also runs like Milan have, or you come fifth, like Atalanta might end up finishing getting in the Champions League, ultimately you've qualified for the Champions League the following season. And so you may as well win a trophy. And Atalanta had no chance of winning that cup final at all. It was one of the most one-sided cup finals I've seen. It was very similar to what we saw in 2019 between Atalanta and Lazio. And in 2021 when Atalanta... Okay, okay, uh, Patrick... (laughs) No, I'm I just saying, I think he's been really shabbily in. treated. And my <laughs> final word on this, because I know I need to give Mickey the floor, even though I'd love to just go on a 20-minute monologue about it. I think he's been really shabbily treated because Juventus have basically done what Lecce did with Roberto da Versa. But there's a big difference between headbutting a player and taking off your jacket. OK, there is, there are... Support for Serie Chronicles is brought to you by Manscaped, who are the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Shaving your jewels doesn't have to be risky business anymore, thanks to the lawnmower of 5.0 Ultra. This trimmer is all about keeping things smooth and safe so you can trim with confidence. Treat your boys down there and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com to get 20% off plus free shipping with code SERIA. With Manscaped, it's easy grooming. No surprises. So... I actually gave my shave to um, to my best friend um, because, you know, I don't really understand that much about these things. And I sort of was laughing about it because I was like, why do you guys get so excited about shavers? But he was really excited. And I don't know if that's the usual reaction to get something like that. I was like, oh, it's really good, actually. So is that normal or is that just weird? Uh, yeah, I think it's a great gift idea. It's the sort of thing where... I think men, I don't want to come across with a sweeping gender stereotype, but here you go. I think typically (laughs) men probably wouldn't buy this for themselves, but I think it's an excellent gift idea. It's the sort of thing where if you're given it, and I'm Mm. very grateful to Manscaped for having given me this wonderful kit, Exhibit A, which has got all sorts of things in it. We've got a crop smoother. uh, We've got a crop preserver. And a couple of uh, very handy gadgets with all of the various things that you need beautifully presented and I actually gave it a whirl I'll spare yeah. you the details but um it's uh it's very good it's very effective because the thing you're most concerned about is obviously not cutting yourself it's quite a delicate area again um I'll try and spare you any more details than that but it does allow you to it's hygienic it's safe uh it was very smooth I was then able to moisturize again something I wouldn't ordinarily do but when you're given this lovely presented package with all of these uh, shavers and creams and ointments and so on and so forth and the various gradings so you can get the length right it's it's quite a nice um 
is treating yourself. And I don't think men treat ourselves enough. And I think whereas um, women typically might go and see the beautician and, and go for a, a wax or what have you, you don't really, as a man, certainly in my experience, I've never gone and done likewise. So the idea that I could then, in the comfort of my own home, tend to that particular area of my anatomy was nice. So I'd like to thank Manscaped for that. And, and I, I was, you know, you're a little bit wary of it initially and you think, I don't need that. But then as and when you use it, I have to say, you are now uh, preaching to the converted. I'm a Manscaped fan. Uh, same as me, right? I had to find someone else for mine. I gave mine actually to one of my, my best friend's husbands, which is a, a conversation to have with your best friend about is this an appropriate <laughs> gift to give to your husband. Um, but I checked in on him before because I knew we were going to be talking about this. And uh, and he seems very, very pleased as well, echoing a lot of what uh, Patrick said. And he said, actually, the nose and ear trimmer that came in the kit was also uh, really great as well. So definitely some some good tools for all sorts of grooming, actually, from Manscaped. So well worth checking out if uh, any of that sounds like something you might like or also as we've all just been saying um for a gift idea as well maybe yes. Patrick that is actually a really good point because a lot of the times that you know I'll you know like for my birthday or whatever it is people will buy me all these kits with like lotions and potions or like gift cards or anything that that sort of you know beautifies you or use these lotions and there's really nothing that I feel like I could get for a man on that occasion so it's really horrible presents a lot of the time like uh, you know here's a tie <laughs> or here's a pair of socks pair of but tops, this yep. This kind of makes you, it's also the lotions and potions. I do think goes, it's a really nice touch when you give that box because it looks very impressive. So I think that's, it's also a really great gift idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, it's wonderful. So you can get 20% off and free shipping. Just to remind you guys with the code Celia at, at manscaped.com. Uh, if you are thinking this sounds like something you want, please do use that code. It helps us out, guys. We'd love you to do that. There's 20% off as an added incentive to do it. Free shipping uh, with that code Celia at, at manscaped.com. Show your balls some love and feel free as a dove. Oh. No, Patrick, wait, it's not about that. It's not about taking off your jacket, though. It's also about the tutor sport thing, right? With Guido Vicaggio. It's about lots of things. It's about, it's about going out and threatening. To, uh, it's mostly about that, to be honest with you. I, listen. And, and then telling, and then telling um, Juntori, you know, go away, which by I the way I loved. <laughs> but it was also not allowing any of the Juntori to come and celebrate with the team. Yeah, no, that, it seemed like he just lost the plot. It. And and while I will, as a fan of Juventus, be in awe of it, as a professional, I can absolutely understand that that is not the right behaviour. Should I just go? Should I just, yes, should please. I just... No, Nikki, now it's you. It's all you, Nikki. I, I, oh, I thought you meant go as in start speaking. Sorry, I wasn't saying please go. <laughs> I was waiting. Um, get I out. Just, just, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's all right. I'm, I'm going to get my popcorn. <laughs> I, um, I, I'm, I was so tickled by Patrick saying about getting things off his chest because that shirt very nearly literally came off his chest. I mean, we, he has thrown that jacket plenty, but that shirt, I mean, you can see on the pictures, we are, we're a long way undone. And <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, maybe this isn't the reason, but like, there are quite a few jobs where if you started getting naked in the middle of the workday, you, you might be at risk of losing your job. So yep. my, my, uh, my feelings on that, I think Depends are... on how sexy you are. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> if it was a woman coach, I feel like everyone would be so on board. <laughs> no, I think that would still be super unprofessional. <laughs> um, but I, I, have to, I have to pull up on this. On, on... First things first. Yes, the cup final events were, were very good. Very, very good. Atlanta didn't have a sniff. Like, they went behind. That was the end of the game. It was it was really impressive. But if we're going to talk about this concept that we always have to come back to with Juventus, and I saw Maurizio Sarri having a couple of little uh, digs about it the other day. Um, but if we're going to come back to the, to this uh, concept of at Juventus, winning's the only thing that's mad that matters. Okay, he won the cup, and that is important. Winning a trophy is important. He also has won four of his last 19 games in charge, I think. Or maybe it's 18, because I think I've just counted the Bologna game, which of course he wasn't in charge for. Four of the last 18. So if winning is the only thing that matters, Juventus haven't done a lot of that at all since January. They really haven't. It's been dreadful. I think pretending that it hasn't been dreadful because they won a cup is ridiculous. He was always going at the end of this season. I do understand as a personal, as a personal thing, I understand him feeling all this tension getting that win in the cup final and feeling some sort of I don't know rage that you need to get out of yourself I get that um I also think that from 
the club's point of view, they might have shot themselves in the foot because I think he probably can make some successful complaint about his dismissal now because have they really got the correct um, the correct standing legally for a premature dismissal? I don't know. I, I think he'll probably have a decent chance of, of kicking up a stink about that. But I, I mean, come on. At the same time, come on, let's not rewrite this as Allegri was, was great all the way to the end. The last part is in. But who said crap, that? I'm sorry. Who said that? I, I, I no stage yeah. said that. What I was saying was, I resent the fact that his position has been constantly undermined. The club have provided him with no assurances. So either come out and be very frank and say, Allegri is going to be leaving the club at the end of the season. We will find a resolution for the remaining 12 months on his contract. Or say, Allegri is our coach until the end of this season. We want no more further speculation. We'll announce things in due course. Don't leave him high and dry. I, I was a no st stage defending his record. His record has been poor. What I would say is, as devil's advocate, he will argue that the winning is the only thing that matters motto applies really to overall competitions and actually winning silverware as opposed Absolutely. to matches over the course of 90 minutes. And I would argue that once you've fallen away in the title race, which they did spectacularly, as I said, whether you finish second or fifth, I don't think matters too much. Maybe it does if you want to look back and say... But ultimately, you know, second is the first loser. I think Juventus would probably embrace that. What I, I, what I think is, I think it's Juventus being very cynical, quite sneaky. They're trying to save on a year's wage by Absolutely. firing him for gross misconduct. And I think it's, it's, it's not Disgusting. really the way to have done it. You could have easily, you, you, you could have easily said, you've embarrassed the club. How about we give you 30% of what you're owed and we label this as mutual consent people would have speculated as to whether it was and and I, I agree you can't go out abusing people as he did with the Guido Vasciago who apparently is the editor of Tutor Sport. I couldn't I, I've occasionally seen some videos of him on Twitter doing sort of uh, <clears throat> thought pieces um but again I would say that it, um if you're being constantly criticized and then you see the person who's responsible for that criticism because their paper is you know when emotions run high, as they do, then people occasionally make mistakes. I'm not saying his behaviour should be condoned. I'm saying that we should, we should give him a little bit of leeway on that. But yes, if he's going around abusing uh, female delegates from Lega, then that, of course, is beyond the pale. So I think we need to definitely condemn that. But equally, uh, I think you need to look at all of the context to it. And I think Allegri was sort of pushed right to the brink. Just to, just to come back as well on, on, on Sally, because Sally's He's had, he's had a lot to say in the last day or so. I'm trying to think of the event he was at. It was at an event where he basically spoke to a journalist and he's, he's had some opinions, um, including this idea that, oh, if the only thing that matters is winning, then does the Coppa Italia count enough? Which is kind of him getting his dig in and, and that's pettiness. But he I hates he the Coppa some... Italia as well, doesn't he? He, he always exactly. has done. And pretty much every cup, to be honest with you. He seems to just generally treat a lot of <laughs> a lot of cups as an inconvenience, doesn't he, Sally, that he has to put up with? But I, um, I did think just... Seeing Sally again, I think Mina touched on it just now, but I just think it's worth highlighting. Actually, Juventus do, rightly or wrongly, and a lot of people will roll their eyes and, and groan at the idea of it, but they do like to push this idea of the Stila Juve, the, the, the Juventus style, the, 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 the way we do things, which is proper. And for Sally, the whole season he was there, it was, oh, he wears a tracksuit. Oh, he's going to wear a tracksuit. Okay, he's found this sort of semi-formal way to be on the sideline, which is that acceptable? Is that enough in the Stila Juve? And I think that Mina, again, she, she already touched on it with, with Allegri being company man. He's always been excelling at that. I just think in terms of a, a sort of perfect encapsulation of the beginning and end, what more could be the perfect visual for the end of him fully abandoning, literally ripping off the suit that perhaps is confining at a certain point, feeling like you have to wear the company suit? Well, F your company, I'm on the way out. You know what it is? I think that, <clears throat> you know, you've watched Allegri become a Juventus fan. And it's become so deeply rooted within him. He was just a, a coach before, right? He was the coach of Milan. He arrived. He was never loved. He arrived on the first day and pelted with booze and criticism and tomatoes and told that, you know, where to go because Antonio Conte had just left a real Juventus fan and Allegri had arrived, much to the chagrin of everyone around him. And then 
he has built himself, right? And it's always been, yeah, but Conte laid the foundation. Like, no one's ever really loved Allegri, right? Except he really fell in love with the club. And I think that's, you could see that. And I think that is, it's very hard to watch a coach sort of fall in love and then get treated like that. Just from a human point of view, so I think, think a lot of us... you think betrayed by the club, Mina? Is that what I you're saying? I absolutely do. And one of the reasons is, is that in 2017... Yeah, like he, this is all mentioned by in 2017 he was approached by PSG to take over and um, I love Nikki just laughing um, and I'm he mean. he and he rejected that offer he was then approached by Real Madrid and Real Madrid has always been a club that he has wanted to eventually go to and he rejected he was approached again last season just before Ancelotti arrived and he signed the contract. But then Andrea Agnelli came. And this is where I have such an anger to a lot of these reporters who come out and talk about Juventus. You know nothing. You know that part. When you come and say, Allegri stole money. Allegri is just like doing it for the money. He never did it for the money. Real Madrid offered him so much more. He rejected that to come back to Juventus because that's how much this club meant to him. That's how much the whole project, Agnelli, everything meant to him. And so he did come back. He took less money, really, honestly, than what he was offered to take this job. And if you do say, if you know, fans of the club often go, this is Juventus. Well, if you want to be, this is Juventus, then you also have to understand you have to pay money to get the best, you know? I love the fact that they all, like, think they want to be a top club, but then want to pay three million for a, a coach. Then you're not Juventus. <laughs> then you're just a regular team, you know? So they paid whatever they did, nine million for him. He's come in. He's done the best that he can. Now, when the board resigned he came up to Elkan and said would you like me to resign too as a token as as somebody who has been employed by former the former board and Elkan said I really need you to stay because we need somebody to tie over the old management to the new management and so he did like he has done everything from a point of view of I love Juventus and I'll do what's right so I think it's it's rather awful um the the way that he was in the end sort of exactly what you said Patrick a case of we're trying to save money on his last year. So let's try to figure out a way of just chucking him out early and then saving money on this. To a, a coach who in particular has always shown a deep level uh, of love for this club. And I think one of the few who has really gone out and defended. And every day he, every day he is Stefano Pioli. Stefano Pioli as well with Ranić, right? Like I find this horrendous, horrendous journalism where every time that they sit down, they're asked whether or not they're going to keep their job. As well as Thiago Motta, are you going to... It really is awful, especially when you're the coach, that you understand that you're being pushed out. It's a horrible thing to do. I get asking, right? You can ask once a month. But the every single three days, especially when they're involved in different competitions, I think is so disgusting, to be honest with you, from a journalistic point of view. You keep reminding the coach that he's on his way out. We get it. We get it. We do. Like, stop asking the question. Um, and I just think in the end, he's just felt like Gentoli has made it so clear he has absolutely no affection for for uh, Allegri. We understand that. We understand that this is now his team and he gets to decide what's going to happen moving forward. We understand that Allegri wasn't a good fit. Um, we also understand that Allegri losing his mind is somebody who has been caged for so long and been professional for so long. And where did it get him? Where did it get him? So it's like, you know what, F you, this is going to be my time. I get to sit here next to the ultras and enjoy as I watch my boys lift a trophy. And I think that is a great ending for him. It would have been nice for him to just at least have finished the season. But it is what it is. And I think that he will go down a legend. I'm almost happy for him because I think he won back a lot of the Juventus fans in that sense as well. Because it was just deep injustice. And you know what, if Zinedine Zidane had to go out with a headbutt, then I'm glad that Allegri went out with a with a striptease. So. Just got a couple a couple more points. Um, I, I hate the whole Stile Juve Juve style argument because to me it just reeks of well it reeks of hypocrisy. If if the club were whiter than white, then fine. But the, you know this is a club with a exactly. with a checkered legacy throughout the years, and I, I won't go into any more detail than that. You know the, the facts are there for people to look into. So I don't think you can be all holier than thou and then expect people to stand up to certain standards if you know time and again down the decades we've seen instances of foul play um with Allegri I actually feel a little bit sorry for him because I do think his star has waned and what you were saying there about PSG and Real Madrid that's all part of the past and that was 
basically on on the legacy of his first spell in charge. I think we need to judge him on the recent evidence the same way we did with with Mourinho at Roma and and his previous jobs. And it reminded me a little bit of Mourinho sort of coming out belatedly and saying I was offered the Portugal job but I turned I turned down my national team to coach Roma. It reminded me of Wenger every time there was a great player who became a global star. No, Patrick, this oh, is... I could have signed him. Do you know what I mean? It's, no one cares. No, this, is no response, one cares. this is in response to him, people saying that he took the Juventus job for money. He took it back for money or he was doing this to to satisfy I his think life. I think he took it because he I was missed saying, the no, boat and that was the only opportunity the that he had. No, he had Madrid. That's why. That's what I mean. That's when exactly did he have what I Madrid? mean. He when signed he the contract with Madrid, cancelled the contract to go back to Juventus. It was the same year. Florentino right. Perez has talked about it in 2021. When he came back to Juventus that summer, he had already signed a contract. He had to call back Perez and say, I'm yeah, really sorry. Yeah, when his stock was very high. It doesn't matter whether their stock is high. I'm replying well, solely does, about the because criticism. I, I would I would argue that Patrick, the first season second. he had at Real Madrid, I he would have been that that's fired he... mid-season, whereas Juventus actually allowed him to stay on for three years despite underperforming. So there's a big difference. No, Patrick, I, I don't mean the last season. I'm talking about when he took back Juventus's job. I understand yeah? that. He hadn't had that, yeah? I'm replying to the criticism that he only took Juventus to satisfy his wallet. So there's a yeah. lot of criticism about him only having taken that job with Juventus because no one wanted him and because he wanted money. And my point mm -hmm. to the response to that was actually he just signed a contract with Madrid. So it's not about judging him now. You're right to say that this what happened and thereafter has been terrible. But I'm saying at that point, he didn't take the Juventus job for money. Yeah, and I'm saying as a cynic, he's an intelligent man. He will know that Real Madrid under Florentino Perez, coaches typically don't have huge job security. Whereas he had a lot more credit in the bank at Juventus where he'd had five years in the previous spell. And lest we forget, in his first year back with Juventus, newly promoted Monza got their first ever Serie A win against Juventus. They had, they had drawn one game and lost their first five. Giovanni Strop had been sacked. It was a rookie coach, Raffaele Palladino. They went, then went to Turin and won as well. I don't want this to be misconstrued as, as me painting Allegri's three years in charge of Juventus second time around as being overwhelmingly successful. I think it's been a failure. But I think there are mitigating circumstances. What I would say is for him to make out that he's gone back to Juventus um, because of some sort of love for the club or honour, I'm sure there, that is part of it. But I don't think it's as, as black and white, if you'll excuse the pun, as that. I think that, yes, maybe he might have been offered more money uh, in Spain. But then you have to go to Real Madrid and you know that if you lose two of your first five matches, you might be out of a job. You have to learn the language. I'm not sure he made strides to do that. This, you know, it's it's more comfortable. He no, knows Patrick, what he's doing. No, Patrick, I think that's a lot true. of... No, I think that's... I'm sorry, I'm going to have to defend him on this occasion because I think okay, we, most coaches, if you have the chance of coaching Real Madrid, you have the chance of coaching top athletes at the top mm. of their game. You have the opportunity to win trophies. Also, if you are that top-level athlete or a yeah. top-level coach, you always believe that you're the guy that's going to make a difference. So why you're didn't going to have he take an ego. it? Did he bottle it? You're going to have an e No, because this is what I'm talking to you about, about Juventus means a lot. That's why I tell you he's become a Juventus fan. Juventus have come to mean so much to him. And there is this part of him that is very attached to Andrea Agnelli coming back and saying, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry for what happened in 2017 because of the fact that at the time... He felt that he let down Allegri and Allegri felt let down because in that Champions League final, he said, I didn't have anyone to play, whereas Madrid did. And you needed to listen to me. I wanted to buy midfielders. You didn't give me the midfielders. And he said, I'll let you have it this way, this way, whatever you want. I'm going to let you have it this time around. And he said, OK, then I'll come back. I think that's that's the difference is that he has become a Juventus fan. Of course, there is all this, you know, like he feels comfortable there. He knows that, of course, you know, but I do think turning down Real Madrid, you know, it's something that stays with you. Like Totti in every interview, right? He always tells us he let, he, let, he didn't go to Real Madrid. It's a big deal. And he is going to feel it's like he would have made the difference. It's a bit of a to compare Allegri with Totti, I think. I mean... No, but I mean, no, but you know what I mean. <laughs> but at the end of the day, there is always this part of you as a top level coach that thinks you will make the difference. Pe Perez twice has come in for you. You do think that you're going to win with. You don't think, oh, I'm probably going to get sacked because you're not going to be a top level a third coach. Time? I don't think so now. Mm. Because I think that what you've said is what happened afterwards is true. He didn't do very well. And so that is going to impact him. But I don't think that that means he's out of any top level coaches no I do think he'll still make it back one day I don't think it'll be Real Madrid because I think now he's too old okay maybe we've had too much of an argument on Allegri now <laughs> but either way um that has been one of the biggest stories in in Italy I think another big story has indeed been about Oak Tree and Inter
Inter celebrated the trophy. There were a lot of tears at San Siro. It was a beautiful choreography in the stadium. Congratulations again on another brilliant, brilliant season. Um, there's just been so many cool pictures and videos that we've watched. Um, but there's been somewhat of a, a weird atmosphere because as much as they were celebrating this, we also understand that there's a loan to be repaid to Oak Tree that um, Stephen Zhang had taken out. Um, so we know that Inter had needed a lot of money. So he took out this loan and he had to pay a lot of interest, I think 12% at the time. It's working out to just under 400 million now that needed to be repaid yesterday. But there was a bank holiday in Switzerland, which meant he had an extra day and it needs to be repaid today by 5 p.m. Um, as, as we're talking now, it's, it's 1 p.m. English time, 2 p.m. Italian time. Um, it's highly unlikely that the, the, the loan will be repaid, which means that there's question marks as to who and what the ownership will look like at Inter after today. Um, now, Beppe Marotta has somewhat looked a little bit troubled. He's cancelled a few meetings last week and a few appearances on TV because he has to have to deal with this. From a purely practical or top-level point of view, we know that Marotta stays in place and not much will change. But of course, this situation is also very different to what we saw with Milan, where effectively the club was repossessed and under the management at the time of Elliot. We don't know if that's going to happen now. Nikki, yeah, I feel like I you're trying even that the Marotta situation is is even that it's it's a short term we know mm. so what what we know is that Oak Tree already has representation on Inter's board so Oak Tree have not been completely without this situation all the way through but the majority shareholding it's somewhere around sixty seven percent has been held by Suning during this period um, what what differs in a big way between the situation at Milan um, and the situation now is um, Li Yong Hong had taken out. A, a full loan from Elliott Management to buy Milan, and so they were able to just fully repossess the club because he didn't pay pay off the debt on his loan. Suning had control of Inter, and then took out a loan subsequent to that to to support costs. Like a lot of clubs, they were running up extra debts associated with the pandemic. Um, and as Mina says, that's run up to just shy of four hundred million euros now, in, with the interest added on. As Mina's really said, we are recording in the middle of the day it's possible something dramatic will happen but it seems extremely unlikely that uh Suning will will come up and uh, the Zhang family will come up with the money to to pay off this debt they had been trying there was this whole negotiation with PIMCO uh, where for a while it looked quite optimistic but obviously that has not come through for various reasons so the likelihood is they are going to default on this debt but defaulting on this debt for all the reasons just said does not mean they immediately lose ownership to um uh, to Oak Tree. Oak Tree will have an opportunity to effectively themselves come up with the difference in what they're owed and the valuation of Inter's assets. And if they can come up with that amount, then they can force a purchase of Inter as a way of, of forcing uh, Suning to, to pay their debts. It is a bit more complicated than, than the Elliot situation was, but it still looks probable that the outcome of this will be Oak Tree taking control of the club. And um, the uh, the other thing to say on that is what we don't know, because Oak Tree haven't given us public indication of it, is exactly what that would mean in the the short to medium term. It's not expected that Oak Tree want to run a football club. But if you remember with Elliot, Elliot did run Milan for a while until they found an appropriate buyer and then sold the club. So will there be an interim period now when Oak Tree control the club? How long would that be? Do they have a buyer lined up to come in and, and take the club off them right away? These are the questions we don't have answers to. And I think that in terms of Marotta specifically, I think probably every Inter fan wants Marotta to stay involved because he's done some very shrewd transfer business for them and helped the team to stay extremely competitive during this period when they have sold assets uh, during these transfer windows. And I think that in the short term, Oak Tree are not going to rock the boat. They'll absolutely leave him in charge. But if Oak Tree did have a new buyer, that's when the situation becomes more uncertain. If there's a new ownership coming in, they might have completely their own ideas about how they want to do things. And we have no idea right now who that potential third party could be. So there is a lot unknown in this story at the moment. Um, Huge amount. Yeah. So it, it's it's a difficult one to cover in a, in a really... Um, certain way i suppose because we, we don't know what's going to happen we have an idea of the first things that are going to happen we fully expect sooning to lose control of the club but where we will be in 
a month, six months, a year? Those are all difficult questions. Yeah, there's a, there's an overall lack of transparency, I think, in the reporting, which is understandable mm-hmm. because, you know, you're not going to necessarily make the media party to all of the ins and outs of, of these complex financial operations. What I would say is I read a piece by very authoritative financial sports journalist um, Marco Bellinazzo, who works for Il Sole 24 Ore, which is an Italian finance newspaper. And he seemed to suggest that Oak Tree would have an interest in forcing a sale because then they would benefit from a percentage of the capital gains on said sale. So, I mean, they, they, there are a lot of conflicting reports. I've spoken to people close to the club as well who aren't exactly certain as to what's going to happen. The only thing I would question, just from a logical perspective, and I'll hold my hands up and say I'm a pure layman and beyond sort of paying my mortgage, I'm not particularly well versed in, uh, in finance. But um, I don't really see what the incentive would be for Oak Tree to issue a loan to uh, Sunning in this case and Sunning putting up the club as collateral if Sunning are only going to put up X amount of shares as collateral as to the amount that they owed. Like there doesn't seem to be any jeopardy there. You know, if you, if you default on the loan, then you only lose the corresponding amount of shares. To me, surely you would have to put up collateral, which would be superior to that and this is the sort of risk reward trade off. But again, that's my supposition. And I'm clearly wrong on that because from the sounds of it, they'd only be entitled to the equivalent amount in shares. And then Suning would have to try and make sure that, you know, they would then seek a valuation, I think, which would come from a, from a oak tree designates someone who would value the club at what they think is market value. And then they sort of go from there, but I think it's going to drag on and, as you said, it looks like it's going to be continuity on an operational level. They want to keep the same management in charge because this is the management that has seen him to win seven trophies under Stephen Zhang. And I thought there was a nice banner from the Court of Nord saying, Grazie, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen, for the, for the seven trophies they've won under Suning in, in eight years. Yeah. I, I do think it's interesting how combative Stephen Zhang has still been, putting out mm. a, a, a statement on the official website as well, which feels like a real way to do it, um, that's still there, at least it was when I last checked, on the website of this club that he may not own in a, in a, uh, by the end of the day, um, saying, oh, we haven't tried to cooperate with this. I don't know. It, it's just the, the wording of it struck me as someone who hasn't given up yet. And I find that interesting because it doesn't really seem obvious how there's a way out for them now um maybe that's not what it is maybe it is just a, a defiant uh, fair, uh final message but it, it felt like he has why did this why did yet. he feel so slighted when you mm. take out a loan you know these are conditions you know that's mm. the the interest rate exorbitant but of course it's going to be for market rates at the time plus the amount that you're actually you know and and considerable risk for the lender during a pandemic. Completely. And as we've seen, they're, they're not in a position to be able to pay it back, hence, hence mm-hmm. all of those reasons. So to then come out and you know, be outraged at the fact that someone who has uh, issued this loan to you then wants you to pay it back on time, to me, was, was, I was quite taken aback by that. I was surprised. To be honest. But, a, yeah. a lot of the financial um, analysts have said that they were quite surprised by Stephen Zhang, because what did you expect? Um, mm. in the sense that this is what happens when, you, when you're dealing with finance company. You, they take on the risk, but there is a reward. I mean, they will take the shares, but they do also take the governance, right? So then they will create their own board and then they get to decide what happens. Mm. And that's effectively what Zhang has put in their hands. It's like this loan. They do get their share equivalent, but also the power. And I think that's, that's quite hard for him to swallow at the moment because from, I guess, from a human or po- point of view, he is young, right? Um, he thinks to himself, we're good for it. We, you know, we're going we're gonna to repay you, just hold on. But it's not the right way to go about it because that's not how things work in the finance world, right? You need to pay. More importantly, Oak Tree have made it very, very clear that they have no interest in running a club, that they just simply want their money and they're out. <laughs> um, entirely I different think to Elliot. always made people crazy, right? It mm. made Marathi crazy. Marathi dumped like a billion euros worth of family holdings into the the into the football club because he just loved it and and people people make reckless financial decisions for football when they when they love it he's just now just relinquished you... control hasn't he i think of saras he's no longer in charge so that's uh, mm-hmm. that's at an end anyway it it also goes to show you sort of some of the business financial decisions taken you know the loan 20, 12% the amount of money i mean people are like no that's fine but then you sort of look at the way that real madrid or 
city or others maybe not city right now but how (laughs) (laughs) with a hundred of anyway but the point is is that when you look at for example like how teams who are well run how they do preserve their money exactly Mm -hmm. atalanta who've spent 40 million on their salary on their entire squad salary it really shows you how a well-run club can achieve so much and on the whole, Inter have been very well run, at least from Pepe Marotta, at least from a sporting point of view. They're incredibly well run the way that they've spent money. Um, but Stephen Zhang, ever since China had the issue with them having assets abroad, then it became a problem, unfortunately. And then they had to pivot and try to find different ways. Um, but like you said, Patrick, he's won so much for Inter. The, f- the fans and a lot of the players have really bonded with him. He's a young young president um there was a lot talked about him in the beginning where it's like does he know what he's doing but Inter succeeded under him how much of that is down to to Maroto how much is that that down to him he's the one who chose the people who came to work at the club right he's the one who knew how to delegate impressively well which is something that I'm not entirely sure that we've seen right now in the rest of Serie so um yeah I really liked his approach you know he basically said he did what you do in industry you look at best practice. Best practice at the time was Juventus. He said, who can we get from Juventus? We can get Beppe Marotta and we can get Antonio Conte. All right, then you can leave aside the fact that certain other signings failed, like Asamoa and Quadrado this season. But in terms That's of the cool. key positions, mm-hmm. you know, he went and got Antonio Conte, who was the one who established Juventus's nine-year winning run. And he went and got Beppe Marotta, who was recognised as the best sporting director in the Italian game and gave him an even more significant role above the sporting director as CEO for sport. And I think if you get those important hires right, and, and we know that Marotta has clout within the league, we know he has great contacts. And aside from a few questionable deals, you know, paying Alexis Sanchez to leave the club only to then re-sign him, um, buying Arnautovic for a big fee, that's not really worked out. But in the main, the bulk of the transfer deals have been very good. And especially when you look at Marcus Turam on a free, all right, 8 million euros, I think, in agent fees and things, but he's now worth 10 times that much. I think that's what his release clause is. So well, they've that, made that is the legacy. They've made as well. They, they, they've accepted. They've accepted a need to sell and, and bring in. But the, 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 the financial side of things is Inter have reduced losses, I think, mm. every year. It's just that they're still making losses. That's the problem. They have been working mm. in a... I guess a virtuous direction is just mm. it's a long way to go absolutely there were so many losses I mean and more importantly they've educated a fan base that has allowed them to be patient and to watch some of the biggest stars leave and not sort of freak out if you like um I think that as you're saying they're working towards a virtuous path uh long may it continue because I think we need some strong sides for next season and we hope that Inter is not going to be destabilized by this. Do you think that that means that Inter are not favourites for next year? Just a quick question. I think they are still favourites. What I liked was the comparison that um, someone made as it's classic Pazza Inter. You know, they have this craziness within them that's inherent in the sense that 2010, the treble, and then on the night they win the Champions League, Mourinho's in tears, he's off to Real Madrid. 2021, they win the title under Antonio Conte for the first time in 11 years, and then suddenly they have to sell Lukaku and Hakimi because the club have got no money. 2024, they win the 20th Scudetto, the second star, and all of a sudden, the day that they're celebrating, all of the news overshadowing it is the fact that the president's about to be deposed because of this loan default. So, I mean... If they can keep the senior management together and keep the playing staff together, and crucially Simone Inzaghi, who's the architect of all this recent success, then yes, they start as overwhelming favourites for next season. If something changes and they have to make a key sale, Barella, Lautaro, someone like that, then we could th- see things change. But much will depend on who the hires are at Juventus and Milan, I think, as well. Nikki, you agree, right? Uh, broadly, yeah, it's, it's too soon to really know what's happening next season. I'm a huge Simone Inzaghi fan. We've talked about that loads. I, who knows? I, I don't want to drag us back to a Juventus conversation, but we didn't actually mention the <laughs> fact that in their game, some of the positive stuff was looking at Kiersa and Yildiz on the pitch together. Maybe a new manager comes in and sees that, they get Fajoli back and Juventus are more competitive again. All that stuff is guesswork. Maybe Antonio Conte will be in the league doing Antonio Conte things. There's lots, lots of, of moving parts that we have no idea about but do I think Inter will be very strong as long as Simone Inzaghi is the manager and they don't sell the entire squad then yeah I think they'll be very strong well we spoke about some good management and and Patrick brought up Atalanta Atalanta of course have a Europa League final to contest uh tomorrow evening that's Wednesday evening um against Olympus I was gonna say Olympiacos but it's not it's by Leverkusen (laughs) yes they really do wish um it's by Leverkusen who finished their season 
undefeated, um, an incredible feat managed by very few before it. Um, and certainly not in the Bundesliga, at least. So well done to them. Now, this could be their first potential loss when they, took on, when they take on <laughs> oh, Atalanta. Man. Is it their first could potential be. loss? <laughs> I mean, listen, there's a lot, right? There's a lot to talk about in the sense that mm -hmm. Atalanta, Coppa Italia, you know, you guys were very firm on the fact that, you know, there's always that potential with Juventus. I was very firm on the fact that Juventus looked dreadful and they'd be out, you know. But as it was, they played one of their best matches in the last uh, certainly 16 games. So, and lifted the trophy. <laughs> but um, there are question marks on how Atalanta do, do really what they manage in actual finals. So this is going to be a tough one for them. They will be without Darun. There's been some lovely um, fan support for the player. Um, but obviously, you know, Scamacca missing for a final was huge in the in the Coppa Italia. Um, Scamacca will be there. He's one of their most important players. This is a Europa League final. How, I mean, you would have to say Leverkusen are the overwhelming favourites, but what percentage would you give to Atalanta potentially winning this, Nikki? Oh, percentages are hard. Um, mm. 25? I mean, that oh, wow. seems really high when you think you're talking about a team that hasn't low. lost Me all too. season. <laughs> I thought um, it was really low. <laughs> but, but, but think of with up against. The team, they're, the team they're playing has not lost all season. So how yeah, am I supposed to... Yeah, it's a farmer's league, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Badrick. <laughs> um, but I... Uh, I, I, I do think when we talk about absences, please don't clip that up. That's me being. We're speechless. joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just clip it up. Um, I uh, I think we talk about absences. I, I love Martin Jeroen. He's one of the most entertaining social media <sighs> presences of all of Serie A. In fact, I think on the podcast as well the other day I was saying probably doesn't get enough credit sometimes because we talk mm. about other players. He's a good player, but if you're mm. asking me which of the two I'd be more worried about missing between Skamaka and Darun, right now it's Skamaka. So I think it's definitely going to be a stronger team that they can put into this final than they could in the Coppa Italia final. Just because goals decide football games and goals decide finals and, and having the player who's been absolutely on fire for this last part of the season, of course, that's that's a big benefit to them. Um I, I don't know what new there is to say because we've talked about this Atlanta team uh, so much and I've talked about all the things I love about it. But in the end, the question is going to be, even if Atalanta are 2-0 up with three minutes on the clock, will Bayer Leverkusen not find a way to score two goals? Because they just do. They just find ways to score at the end of games. Yeah, Patrick. I'm quite hoping for a compromise whereby let by Leverkusen have their statistically unbeaten season and Atalanta can win the game <laughs> on penalties or even after extra time. And that counts, you know, so there, there is a way to satisfy all parties. They seem obsessed with this unbeaten season. And I'm hoping that that might count against them, to be honest. And I think Atalanta are going to be hugely motivated. They didn't do themselves justice in the Coppa Italia final. They have an opportunity. I think if they were to choose which final they'd rather win, they would, they would obviously select this one, not that you can choose. And I think, obviously, Bayer Leverkusen is a stronger opposition on paper than, than Juventus were. But I think they'll be afforded more space, from what I can glean. Uh, by no means an expert on, on the Bundesliga, but I think because of the way Bayer Leverkusen have, have waltzed to the Bundesliga title, because they're playing from all accounts, very adventurous attacking football. I think they're more likely to try and take the game to the opposition than Juventus were, who were quite keen mm. to stifle Atalanta. So I think that could play into Atalanta's hands. You know, the fact they play 11 man against the man all over the pitch. I think De Ketelara was, was bullied by Danilo and, uh, and, um, and Bremer, amongst others. Um, so I would quite like to see... Cope Mainers, De Ketelara and Scamacca are all playing together and seeing them interchange position. And I think that could cause problems. You, could, you know, Guardiola said it as recently. He said, on their day, when they play this well, that was after the Roma game, Atalanta can beat anyone. And I really hope that they do themselves above all, but also the league justice tomorrow night, because I think it would be great for the neutrals to really get... And I, I like to think the Dubliners will be... They won't, will they? Because Xabi Alonso is ex-Liverpool. But I'd love to think that the Dubliners will be behind the, uh, the Bergamaschi. I don't think they will, but um, I certainly will be. I will be cheering on Gasparini. And I hope he can, I hope he can do a strip tease in celebration. <laughs> Gosh. Would you like to see that? Be still my heart. All these sexy men with the striptease. I'm joking. <laughs> it's got a fine head of hair for a 65-year-old man. Yeah. I mean, yes. uh, hmm? Wait, who's got a fine hair? head of hair? Gas. Some of the better hair in. Oh, he! See, it was his strip tease. I thought you talked about. Pepper. 
Yeah. Jabby Alonso. No, no, please let's not see the Gasparini in your strip <laughs> Let's let's maybe she sees Jabby Alonso doing a strip tease. Um you know, I'm I'm looking th- uh so what percentage did you did you settle on, Patrick? Forty percent Atalanta. Yeah, I, w- I would agree with that. I mean, you see, this is a difficult one, right? Because I sometimes look at the, the teams that they've played by Leverkusen, and I don't think that they've, I mean, barring obviously that they've played like, you know, some strong opposition in the Bundesliga. But when I look at the Europa League, I feel like Atalanta have done, played the harder matches. So I wonder if that works for them in the sense that, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I look at by Leverkusen, I think West Ham, you know, Carabag, not not really like, you know, Huge it was opposition. So many out against Carabag. That's the crazy thing. They were they were losing that tie. Um, I mean, if like, you can get Paredes to score two penalties against you, then I'm. Uh, you know. And hang on, but, isn't Liverpool? Isn't that technically on the Irish Sea with the sort of Mersey, the estuary going out <laughs> to the Irish Sea, Dublin the other side? You know, there's a body of water in between. Maybe there'll be some sort of sea air that will inspire them. I'm really clutching at straws here. I, I, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting about both teams is actually both teams can surprise you. I think that if we look back to the first leg between Bayer Leverkusen and, and Roma, there was that decision to start Florian Wurtz up front by Xavi Alonso that really felt like it caught everyone out. And, and, mm. and let's be clear about this. Leverkusen were, were far better than Roma over two times. I know Roma brought it back in the second Absolutely. leg with those penalties mm. and made it look close, but they, they, they were the worst team. Bayer Leverkusen were, were, were distinctly the better team in that time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the, 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 the counterpoint to that in terms of if you want some optimism is, well, Roma played Atalanta right afterwards and Atalanta were miles ahead of Roma. It was a game that finished 2-1 that could have been 5-1 and wouldn't have felt unrepresentative of the game. So so I, I do think that this is a, a much closer tie than, than the Roma ones were. And I, I think that both and yet teams... you gave them 25%. <laughs> I, I mean, if you ask me just to look at the football teams and give you a verdict on what I think of the football teams, it would be higher. But this team has not lost all season. All season. So feel the pressure. Think of the pressure to... they'll be feeling to keep that up for one last match. Mm, mm. <laughs> I don't know. You're right. I don't know if it works with you or against you. I can't, I can't decide on this, you know. We'll decide after are... the result, won't we, I think? <laughs> There's a there's a lot there that resembles the winning mentality that we see from Real Madrid, um, but I, it's a hard one, right? Because I just think of Scamacca. I think so. Let let's talk about I, I you know so now we know that Atalanta have confirmed a Champions League place, so yay for them. Um, we're also praying that they finish in fifth and then win the Europa League, so that we have six okay. teams. Um, Can I do one moment of conspiracy theory? I thought this is going to annoy Patrick, but I'm going to give my conspiracy theory. Oh, you, here we go. You okay. do it. I'm all so, on board with annoying him. Let's go. <laughs> so it's contrary to what we to what we actually thought mm-hmm. previously. It appears that Italy can only get six Champions League spots if Atalanta finish fifth specifically and yes. win and win the um, the Europa League. That appears to be the case. Not six. That's not what uh, I was told by the guy in the competitions department. This is the problem. They've had yeah. to issue a circular letter, UEFA. Giorgio Marchetti's come out, who's even an Italian native. He's having to make statements to the Italian media. It's been badly handled, and I just wanted to make this point. It's unprecedented. Yeah. It's a new Champions League format. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we've ever seen all of these various things before. But that's what yeah. I was told a and, month ago. Yeah, no, we, 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 I'm, I'm, I, we definitely, we had that on, on our end. And, and it's possible, who knows, that that will even still turn out to be the case. But at the moment, it certainly appears that a lot of people think, including some people at UEFA, the UEFA themselves don't necessarily have all their ducks in a row, that... Um, that it's if Atalanta finish fifth or sixth, then Italy can get um, six Champions League spots. But I don't think they can come sixth, can they now? No, no, it's they can't possible. now. But back yeah. then, yeah. we could have. There was. Um, not, I wanted to know if they could finish outside the top four in general, or had to be fifth. Sure, I but it's now so moot. My... I think so. They're definitely fifth, yeah. aren't they? Or fourth, yeah, or third. Yeah. My conspiracy mm. theory is that because now Atalanta's game against Fiorentina will happen after the rest of the season. If Atalanta know that they have got the Champions League spot through winning the Europa They'll lose League, it. could there be a convenient biscotto at the end of the season that works out for Italian football as a whole? I'm just, just leaving no. that little... Uh, no, I think the opposite. I think, I think actually... Yeah, go on, go on, Mina. Well, because Fiorentina also need to finish below Torino to have nine places. <laughs> right. So it's kind of like they both need to lose that to have nine places. Or, or so draw. my uh-huh. my th- my theory is this basically. I think if Atalanta win the Europa League, they're in the Champions League. I think as seeds as well. If even if the format changes, that's the way it used to be. I don't know how it now works with the thirty six teams, but they're in the Europa League. I think they'll expend so much energy and party so much that they'll probably lose on 
the final day of the season, which for them is the penultimate match, because as you said, they still have to recover the game that was called off when, when Joe Barone died. That's the 2nd of, of June mm -hmm. in Bergamo against Fiorentina, who themselves will have played their European final on the 29th of May. So they're going to be flagging. They might be celebrating as well. But I'm not sure because this is huge. And I, I alluded to it in the preview. I think um, we were talking about it off air with, with producer Simon. I alluded to the fact that there's a big rivalry between Atalanta and Roma fans. And that stems back to when they used to be twinned, the two fan bases. And then there was a rival ultra group within the Atalanta supporters who weren't on board with the Roma fans being twinned with the Atalanta fans. So they tried to oust them from the Curva Sud, the sound stand of what was the Atleti Azzurri d'Italia back then. Still gave his stadium, but it had a different name. And then as a result, this Atalanta faction of the supporters stole a Roma banner, which was seen as like one of the worst things you can do in this sort of ultra circles. So since then, it's about 40 years now, there's been pure animosity between Atalanta and Roma supporters. So I feel like that will be conveyed to the players. If there's a way of us stopping Roma from qualifying for the Champions League, let's do it. We're in it, we're at whatever. So actually, let's make sure that we win our matches and come third or fourth. And, and sorry, Roma, you know, tough luck. Conspiracy. And it's, it's, a, it's a long conspiracy, conspiracy theory, but I, I do feel it's that... I, 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 I don't buy into the theory that they'll be thinking, let's get as many Italian teams in the Champions League as possible. I think it's every man for himself. We're in, screw you. That would be very disappointing if they do this. But I do mm. think that maybe the Italian FA should just pay them money and say, lose this. Um, but... <laughs> This is a joke, guys, before everyone gets carried away. But wouldn't that be funny? Because how good for them to have six. But either way, there's also the whole Fiorentina who finishes in eighth, who do Torino not make the conference league at all. Um, but anyway, just just to quickly think, mm -hmm. we can talk about this next week. Mm. But you guys think Fiorentina sh should be favourites for that, right? Or is no. it? No, because it's in Greece. It's in Athens. It's in Athens. Are you really yeah. like you really think because it's Greece that Olympiacos could win this, right? Massively, yeah. yeah. Home okay. advantage right. plan, counts for so much. Mm. So we much. shall discuss that next week. Yes. Not their stadium, good point. What we should probably discuss is the relegation battle. I mean, we've come into this uh, podcast and we was, I was so excited to discuss Juventus. Um, and obviously we were so excited to discuss Inter. And the only thing Patrick has said is, can I discuss Udinese? So whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we will discuss them because we need to discuss... The relegation battle quickly. Um, Is that match finished? I wasn't sure if it was still going. What? what that match? match? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Because it went for like 120 105th, minutes or something. 105th minute yeah. equaliser, yeah. Mm. That's probably why they want to, you want to discuss it. Um, so we know for sure that Sassuolo got demoted this weekend, sadly. It's been a horrible season for them. Um, obviously, you know, they lost Fratese last season and they haven't had Domenico Berardi for much of it. So sad to was see them the go. Grand Prix? <laughs> he wasn't even at he wasn't even at Mape when they got relegated against Cagliari. He was at the Grand Prix in Imola. I mean that's pretty poor form to be honest, but there you go. Hobnobbing. Oh. Mm. I mean the Grand Prix is really is really sucking Serie A dry because El Can's <laughs> focused on Ferrari and no longer Juventus. Ferrari is focused on races, no longer his team. Either way, um Sassuel have gone down, Salernitana have gone down, which means there's one place left to go, and that's gonna be either Empoli, Udinese, or Frosinone. Now, Sky Sport calculate that Empoli have a 55% chance of getting relegated. So Frosinone stand on 35 points, Udinese are on 34, and Empoli on 33. So this is, uh, we're going to have, if, it, if they do, if 18th and 17th are level on points, then there will be a two-legged playoff. Um, Udinese and Frosinone face each other in the final round. So a draw for Frosinone is enough to... Um, to ensure their survival. Um, but Empoli need to either draw with Roma and hope Udinese lose or beat Roma and leapfrog, leapfrog at least one of the other two. It's very complicated. Patrick, you have some thoughts on Udinese who really, really like mm. barely got a draw in the end of that match. I have, I have some thoughts on Empoli. Empoli will definitely beat Roma. That's me going on the record. Empoli will really? definitely beat Roma at the Castellan. Roma are guaranteed to finish in the position they're in. They're ahead of Lazio on head-to-head. -head. They can't be caught by Lazio. They can't catch anyone ahead of them. 
Um, and then cynics will tell you that Roma signed Tommaso Baldanzi in January from Empoli as well. So I don't know if there's any sort of... Oh my God, there's even more conspiracy cynics, theories. Cynics <laughs> will tell you that. I think it's completely unrelated. I just think Roma are away from home. Empoli are at home. I can see Empoli winning that match. I think the crucial game will be at the Stirpe between Frosinone and Udinese. And Udinese are lucky, really lucky, that they got a, a, night, a 105th minute penalty. I mean, it was, a, it was a clear foul, but we were, I think we played 98 minutes by the time that the penalty, well, the incident took place. It's the longest VAR I can remember. Don't quote me on that, but it, it felt like it was about six minutes. Um, and, and basically, Biol missed from a yard out, and then Pajero was trying to follow up on the rebound. His shirt was pulled by Fazzini. Uh, another of the Empoli uh, youth team graduates. And Lazar Samadzic stepped up. And amazing to think that he wasn't even supposed to be at the club because he was pictured, I think, even with an Inter scarf last summer. That move fell through at the 11th hour. So credit to him for stepping up. It was a really good penalty as well. Because if you think otherwise, Empoli have 32, uh, 33 points. Had they won that game, then they'd be on 35 and Udinese would be on 33. The, the shoe would be completely on the other foot. So that's, re that's been really painful to Empoli, but I think they're going to chat and there's been a lot of barbs between the different ownerships. Fabrizio Corsi, the Empoli president, came out and made a statement and there was a response from the Udinese hierarchy. But I think Empoli are going to channel that frustration at what they feel was the game should have ended by the stage that the penalty was awarded in order to then go on and, and beat Roma. So I really couldn't tell you who's going to get the result out of Frosinone and Udinese. Obviously, Frosinone know that if they avoid defeat, they're safe. Um, but I'd, I'd love it if there was an early goal at the Castelloni for Empoli. That news filters through to Frosinone, and then they and Empoli have to really go for it. Um, well, at least Udinese have to go for it, and, and then you have to see whether Frosinone can actually defend. Our hunch would be no, because it's an Eusebio Di Francesco team. But um, I think it's all going to come down to that game. Uh, one of Frosinone and Udinese could be, uh, could be relegated. But I, I take your point on paper. Empoli have it all to do because they're the team actually in the relegation zone and on paper they play Roma. Nikki, who do you think is going down? I, I'd love it to be another playoff because they're dramatic. Me too. And they're <laughs> awful, but they're dramatic. So we can extend the season even further than the second yes. of June. That's true, yeah. Um, no, please, no. <laughs> In that case, I'm not sure why I want this to happen. Yeah, I, I, I understand where Patrick's coming from, but I also just... Empoli, the fact that they needed until the 113th minute, whatever it was to score, just feels emblematic of the problem they've had all season. They're, they're a better team than, than their position suggests. They've played some actually really quite competitive football at times, but they have all sorts of trouble sticking the ball in the net. And if they can't stick the ball in the net this weekend, that could be the end of it. So I, I, I think that I really don't know, but I think I, I might still expect them to go down. Um, I do think we've slightly, in the conversation of saying who's already gone down, we slightly buried the lead as well about who stayed up, which is Cagliari mm. uh, and Claudio Ranieri. That's and because Verona. we wanted you to have the options of, uh, yeah. of speaking about just, this. I'm just forcing my way to talk about it. I wrote about it in my Guardian column. People haven't already read it. But I just think it's such an extraordinary story. And, and I obviously, Ranieri has done so much in his career. He's been all over Europe. He's been at every big club in Italy and and forever I think for most of your non um if you're not a supporter of a team that he managed probably most people will forever just think of Leicester because that was the biggest thing he did winning a league title with Leicester was extraordinary but it, it's just really romantically lovely to see him back at Cagliari where it wasn't his first job in management but it was basically the club where he launched himself because he took Cagliari from having previously only coached in the lower leagues he took them from Serie C1 up to Serie A um, from 1988 onwards um, and did that in three seasons oh, sorry two seasons for consecutive promotions having taken them over after they'd almost been relegated the year before kept them in Serie A then went off and became this incredible manager who got to manage all over Europe comes back middle of last season when they're 12th gets them promoted in the most incredible fashion with comeback in the playoff semi-final and in the final. And then this season, after I think it was after 24 games, they'd lost, I might be getting my numbers wrong, it was something like 24 games, they lost 14 of them. I think it was 24 games, they lost 14 of them. They're headed for relegation again. 
comes into the dressing room and says, should I resign, guys? Do you still want to be with me? Do you, do you, am I the problem? And the players say, no, we, we're all together on this. We're working hard. We can turn it around. And lo and behold, they have. In the next 13 games, only three losses. They get this uh, winning against Sassuolo at the weekend that, that crowns it. Uh, incredibly, if you want to go back to that first stint in 1991, they secured their top flight safety that time around by beating Bologna, which is just up the road from the Mape Stadium, on exactly the same day, 19th of May. So it's exactly uh, 1991 to 2024, exactly 33 years. Can I do maths in my head? I should know that mm. one. Um, and, and exactly the same places. I, he's, he's absolutely... And I think to understand this as well, you have to slightly understand Sardinia, which is, it's Italy, but it's not Italy, if you, mm. if you, if you know what I mean. I, I know you, you know, but for anyone listening who hasn't been there, it, it is its own island. It sometimes feels like its own nation, even though it's attached to, to Italy. And, um, and I think that there really is this sense of him just having become, even though he is a Roman and supports Roma and, and has his whole history there, he's become a national hero national in in quotes um to uh to the people of sardinia he's become a, a a true hero of their island and the reception the team got coming back was just magnificent can i make a case for verona please and marco baroni who's done a better job than claudio ranieri um <laughs> he has because he's so verona... competitive. Patrick Patrick is so competitive. He's like, no, oh, this one's better today, <laughs> today is one upmanship day i'm telling you sorry nikki but i mean marco baroni i mean but for simone inzaghi he's coach of the year this is a verona side that completely uh riddled with financial difficulties the club was basically seized from from what's emerged basically and there were told to sell all their best players in January. Um, Cyril Ngonge went to Napoli. Isak Hien went to Atalanta. Terracciano went to Milan. You know, these are the big clubs picking off these players. All right. Fiorentina signed Fareoni. Doig went to Sassuolo. That's turned out to be a, a bad move for him. He's dropped out of the division. And then, you know, they just cobbled together a, a load of signings again from sort of Northern Europe in uh, in January. They, they recruit very well from the Netherlands in particular. Sean Soliano, who's the returning sporting director. And they're safe with, with more than, with a game to spare. And I like what mm. Nikki was saying there about the symmetry because not quite the same, but in 2011, Verona, who were under Andre, Andrea Mandorlini at the time, they actually won a two-legged playoff against Salernitana to get out of the third tier to get back in Serie B after four years away. This time they won in Salerno to avoid going back down to, to the second tier. And I just think it's been the most amazing job. He's not moaned. He's conducted himself with dignity. They actually play quite nice football. And they keep unearthing these stars. The latest one is Tijani Noslin, who ironically had his worst game yesterday. Should have scored a hat-trick and didn't end up scoring at all. But they've borrowed well. Followed Unsho is outstanding. I fully expect him to start for Napoli. He should be starting. If, if he were at Napoli now, I think he'd be walk into that midfield at the moment. Um, I'm just hugely impressed with them. And, and I like players like Darko Lazovic that actually stayed around when all the other senior players bolted, you know. So I think Ranieri's achievement, excellent. But this Cagliari side didn't see half of their first team sold off in January, whereas Verona did. And despite yeah, that, they've true. actually taken more points in the second half of the season than they did in the first half of the season. And I just think... Baroni should be coaching somewhere better than, than Verona with the greatest of respect to them. Well, I think he should take Genoa and well, Gilardino should take Bologna. Gilardino. But anyway, th this was this was just my, my <laughs> idea, but I agree with you. And he left Lecce at the time because he, you know, it was a miracle that he met and kept them up last season, to be honest with you. And he's he's done such a terrific job because there's no way, no way that I thought Verona. I mean, to the extent of the mm. the the signs, the what the what the protests of the of the fans at the time who held up signs that said this is a car boot sale, this is just <laughs> this is so awful what's happening to us, and then look where they are now. So congratulations to them. I do just want to come back to one thing, just because uh, Udinese Empoli. It was Empoli who scored first, and Udinese who equalised at the end. Just wanted to make that clear. So it was Udinese who needed nine hundred ninety plus thirteen minutes to what is that one hundred and thirty-three? Yes, to score. Oh. Um, just breaking, someone sent me a, a, a thread on Twitter, or X as we must now call it, from Dale Johnson, who's pretty good on sort of all matters VAR in European places. So there was some duff information coming out of UEFA last week. So to clarify the situation for Serie A this season, if Fiorentina win the Conference League and finish eighth or lower, then Serie A will have nine teams in Europe. This goes against <laughs> traditional logic. 
If it effectively means that the team which finishes ninth in Serie A, likely to be Napoli or Torino, can benefit from another team winning a European trophy and finishing in eighth. This never used to be possible before the European performance spot was introduced. This is the new logic. Italy originally has seven places, four Champions League, two UEL and one Conference League. Fiorentina finish eighth and win the Conference League. They qualify for the Europa League through this, which gives Italy two plus one in the Europa League. That's eight teams in Europe, one to four Champions League, five to six Europa League, seventh Conference League, eighth Fiorentina Europa League title holders. Under the new logic, the EPS extra Champions League place is applied last after Fiorentina have taken their place as title holders. In effect, the EPS forces the, champ the Conference League place to jump over Fiorentina and into ninth. One to four Champions League, five Champions League EPS, six Europa League, seven Europa League, eight Fiorentina Europa League, comma, title holders, ninth Conference League. The logic is that the Conference League place passes to the next team that is eligible for a place in Europe and Fiorentina are already qualified. However, if Fiorentina were to finish seventh in the natural Conference League place, then Italy would surrender that place and have no team in the Conference League. To add to the confusion, if Atalanta win the Europa League, Italy has six teams in the Champions League. One to four Champions League, five Atalanta Champions League title holders. However, Serie A would surrender the place in the UEL earned by Atalanta as they qualified for a European position before the EPS was applied. Clear. <laughs> what it really this is the last one in the tweet. I, I apologize for this long thread. What it really means is that a team can now benefit from the success in Europe of another, which was never previously the case. The EPS is a league reward. The reason ninth will qualify for Europe is because Fiorentina won the Conference League and finish eighth. I'm that more confused a, now than I've ever been. That is, I mean, first of all, just no, to that makes sense. Honest, Dale is Dale is really good on this stuff, and yes. uh, and I would absolutely um, trust that. But mm. it seems to suggest then that actually it doesn't matter where Atlanta finished. <laughs> if Atlanta win the Europa League, there will be six Champions League spots. Because what Dale writes is that Italy will use will lose a Europa League spot if Atalanta win that. So they would get six Champions League spots, but they would lose one Europa League spot. That was the first Which thing that UEFA ever said. Which means my source of competitions said. department might actually be right after all that. He's gone very <laughs> quiet on LinkedIn in the meantime, I have to say. So, so the first thing that we ever heard when this was first came out at the very beginning in around November, December... We, I had understood it at the time that whatever extra position that we would gain in the Champions League, we would lose in the Europa League. It's also important to note that Fiorentina are on 54 points. So even if they do win their two in hand, one of which is against Atalanta, they would go to 60, which is level on points with Lazio. Does anyone remember the head? Like, so it's unlikely that they will finish in seventh. So it's eighth onwards for sure which means that it's between Torino and Napoli going down to the wire on the final game. In the, um, Torino play Atalanta next as well, incidentally. So we, so I'm, I'm, so I'm interested to know who's going to finish ninth, but we definitely know that Fiorentina is unlikely to finish in seventh. So um, if you, do you guys remember the head-to-head -head between them and Fiorentina? I don't know. Whether between, or not. At, between who? Fiorentina and... Uh... Lazio, and Lazio, because can, if, they, if Fiorentino it. are to win their next two, then it would they would be level on points with... Well, but Lazio's last game is against Sassuolo, who just got relegated. So Lazio probably... It's, it's unlikely that, that Lazio mm. also don't win a single game, right? So we're, we're yeah. looking at very high odds of like... They need it's one point. They need, they need to draw it. So yeah. It's almost impossible that Lazio don't yeah. finish it. And that game's there. in Rome as well, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. so we're mm. talking about Fiorentina certainly, almost certainly 99%, 0.9% finishing eighth onwards. So yeah. we definitely look like there's a ninth place for Italy. Now, it would have been really lovely if somehow we can win all these competitions and secure a 10th, please. But that's just dreaming. <laughs> but does Maybe. that happen? Because he didn't seem to say that there was scope for 10 teams, did he? He didn't no, say he did. if Atalanta and Fiorentina win, there could be 10. So because, I think a place Atalanta is surrendered. Effectively, cost, effectively, effectively, it doesn't increase the number of spots. It just upgrades yeah. one of them from Europe yeah. to Champions League. Yeah. So, yes. exactly. So, so he could have so, written all that in one tweet. So are we saying? <laughs> so are we saying that... Atalanta don't need to finish in the top five now. In the I top think four. let's just let's just hope Atalanta win the Europa League, and then I think Roma will be on the phone to UEFA and saying, "Are we in the Champions League or not?" That's that's basically what's going to happen. Well, well Roma it? need to worry about getting overtaken by Lazio still. So let's. Uh, they let's can't because they've got their head to head. Oh, yeah, the head to head. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Because of, of uh, Gianluca Mancini. Yes.
which mm. is a, a shame for Lazio, who've done so well now under Tudor. But I'm excited to see what's going to happen next season, especially now that they've confirmed, well, Immobile has confirmed that he sees no reason to leave. So um, either way, I think that we've spoken enough on this pod. <laughs> <laughs> And just to let you know that that producer Simon has just written oh no <laughs> on the potential of Lazio next season. <laughs> that brings to a close another episode of uh, Serie A Chronicles, wonderfully hosted by Mina Razuki. And uh, we had Nikki Bandini and myself, Patrick Kendrick, as ever on the pod. We will be back with some reaction to Atalanta's glorious Europa League victory in Dublin, fingers crossed. And Mina will also be giving you a deep dive on all things Bianconeri. Until next time, bye-bye. Serial Chronicles is a Bayard Chronicles production.